Yeah, we're back. We're live. This is Think Tech Hawaii. More specifically, this is Global Connections. I'm Jay Fidel. The handsome young man is, is Michael Davis, and he joins us from New York. Am I right? Yep. So, um, Michael, um, you know, three things have happened with respect to civil liberties in Hong Kong in the recent past. Uh, the first is that a fellow named John Lee was elected in a what looked like a fake election, uh, as uh, I guess he succeeds the uh, the chief executive of Hong Kong, and he's a plant. Um, and then we had the cancellation of the Human Rights Press Awards. I find that interesting. I want to talk to you about that. And finally, um, the Humanitarian uh, Relief Fund trustees and five pro-democracy leaders in Hong Kong, um, and we have their names, uh, were arrested under the national security law for, and this is my favorite part, my favorite part, for allegedly colliding colluding, um, <laughs> colluding uh, with foreign forces. Now, that's all really interesting, and it all happened in a fairly short, uh, expanse of time. What is going on these days in Hong Kong and civil liberties? Well, really, uh, it's a tragic story. Uh, the government pretends that, well, business as usual, we're just getting a few uh, bad apples here. And, so on when when the, they passed the national security law, as you know, we've talked about this before in uh, mid 2020, and they act like, well, it's not going to you know change Hong Kong dramatically, but it has, uh, and it's aggressively enforced. Uh, it, it, one wonders why so aggressively. I mean, you can pick a few bad apples, as it were, and everyone will get the message. But I, I kind of think that Beijing is calling the shots under this national security law. Beijing sets up in really contrary to what it seems to say in the uh, basic law of Hong Kong, which which was passed many years ago, uh, that uh, for you know the mainland departments would not interfere in Hong Kong. Well, they set up an entire mainland department called the Office for Safeguarding National Security. Uh, and that's staffed. It's got a huge building in Hong Kong, staffed of uh, I don't know how many people, well, lots of people. Uh, and then they set up special units of the police just to focus on enforcing national security. Uh, and uh, well, of course, most of us would think there was really there was some public public order issues, but uh, not really anybody in a position to threaten the national security of China. But in any case, that's how they branded all opposition as a national security threat. Uh, and they've one of, some, one of the things that strikes me, especially in looking at the long list of people being arrested this past week, a 90 year old uh, cardinal, Catholic cardinal, uh, is that there's a bit of score settling going on here. They're going after some of their older enemies, their older critics, people who have uh, tried for years and pushed and, and cajoled them to. Uh, carry out their obligations under that basic law, which was a kind of liberal constitutional order that was the characteristic that Hong Kong always had. Uh, and so these people have seen Beijing slowly kind of eroding those commitments and interfering more and more, and they've been opposing it over the years. Uh, and it all, all in accordance with law. They, the protests that were had were nonviolent in all of these past years and so on and largely ignored by Beijing. So it seems that and now- the trustees right? who were arrested were a very prestigious group. Oh, they yeah. A humanitarian trust that existed for a long time, senior leaders of the community uh, who were well-respected in, in every corner. No? That, that really makes it, it all, the, all the worse. No? Absolutely. One of them was a, a, a former bishop of Hong Kong, the highest Catholic official in Hong Kong for several years. Uh, one is a very prominent barrister, a very old friend of mine, Margaret. The bishop is Cardinal Joseph Zen. Uh, there's a, a singer who basically sings songs about Hong Kong and, and kind of uh, kind of a, an activist in a way for, for the, the protests that were occurring. Uh, and so you got a singer, a cleric, a lawyer, uh, a professor. Uh, and these people ran a fund to provide legal aid services and some humanitarian help to protesters. Over 10,000 protesters were arrested. So they, this is basically the fundament, most fundamental value in Hong Kong has always been the rule of law. And at the heart of the rule of law is the right to provide a criminal defense. 
But now this, this fund, uh, first it was attacked uh, about a, uh, nearly a year ago uh, and forced to disband uh, because, uh, you know, when Beijing starts attacking you, either in the, in the pro-Beijing press and, and then the officials start saying we're investigating the fund, well, then the message is clear. You better wind it up and stop. Uh, and now they, they, what happened was the professor, one of the guys, was going to go take up a job in Italy. So he went to the airport and then immediately they went and arrested all of them. I guess uh, they were fearful that they would leave Hong Kong and apparently they have plans to, to prosecute them. So uh, this, I mean, they had all been arrested, taken in once before, but released. Uh, but this time they're arrested with these uh, collusion charges. So. So this is kind of what's happening. And, and, and this fund, I don't think, posed a threat to anyone. It simply provided the kind of services that we all respect. Uh, and so what seems to be the case is all, you know, during the 2019 protest, when a few youngsters got out of hand and were throwing rocks and stuff, <clears throat> these, these senior members of the pro-democracy camp never used violence ever and were publicly speaking out against using any violence. So why are they suddenly being taken up in all of this national security net? And I guess because they, they're settling scores. They're going after people who have criticized the China's policies in Hong Kong in the past. That, that, you know, that does occur. <laughs> but as I mentioned before the show, I have a theory about uh, a, a, a second purpose in all of this. And it's to send a message to everyone them and everyone else. Uh, and my, my favorite part, why I said my favorite part, uh, is for those who were arrested for uh, colluding with foreign forces. And I yeah. guess that means um, talking to people outside the country. And I recall right. there is a provision in the national security law uh, which makes it a crime to do that. You right. can't even talk about it. So essentially, this is a war against, against the press, against freedom of speech a war against information. It's an attempt to control all the information. Am I right? Yeah, well, that's, that's what it's come out to be. Uh, and it seems to go way beyond any threat to national security. Uh, there was a public order problem in the 2019 protest because of the police. Actually, what happened was on the streets, the police were being very aggressive. Again, we have to assume, you know, again, all you can do is guess because this is all opaque but they were being very aggressive and people were seeing it on the evening news and everybody got angry because the police tactics were way out of line from anything Hong Kong had ever experienced. Uh, and so- People young, were killed. Well, yeah, not many, but in any case, there were people being beaten up a lot. I, I did some interviews in late 2019 because we did a report on Hong Kong. And when I spoke to defense lawyers, they mentioned that almost all their clients uh, had some injuries that there, there was some, that I told them, well, how many, what percent? They were guessing like 60, 70 percent. Wow. So people were getting beat up uh, when they were arrested, uh, had their heads rammed into the pavement, and then when they're in custody uh, as well. So, so this is the, the sort of youngster violence that the, the government likes to showcase was actually a small minority. Two million people marched on the street during the 2019 protest without any violence. Uh, and so a few hothead youngsters watching what the police were doing uh, were sort of mimicking it in their own behavior by throwing rocks and bricks and things. But to use that as an excuse to basically take away all civil liberties in Hong Kong uh, hardly seemed justified, I think, to most observers. Must be very intimidating for anyone. Um... You know, and it reminds me, your description of the street scene reminds me of uh, some of the early protests in uh, Moscow um, to, uh, to Moscow, Putin's invasion of uh, Ukraine. Uh, and I wonder if you could compare, you know, the, de the, the degrading of civil liberties uh, in Hong Kong as against the degrading of civil liberties in, in Russia right now. Well, I think it's a similar sort of a playbook, at least, that you, uh, you basically grab off the streets anyone who offers opposition, and then you try to control information 
Uh, and in the case of Russia and the case of mainland China, they have complete control over the media. So we know, as is widely reported, that Russian people are hearing some Putin version of what's going on in Ukraine. Although some reports today suggest that some people were starting to push back against that in the media business. But nonetheless, that's kind of what people are spoon fed. And, and when that's done, they sort of support the government because that's all they're hearing. Uh, and uh, Hong Kong is a bit of a different uh, story because it still is a, a society where international media reporting does get in. So while mainland China is hearing one story about Russia and its invasion of Ukraine, Hong Kong people will be hearing a different story. But when it comes to the crackdown in Hong Kong, then I think that the media is, there's a serious attempt to cower the local media and any other reporters on the ground trying to cover events by using these kinds of laws about collusion and subversion. And they, then they even took out of mothballs a law that had not been used for decades called a sedition law, which was a colonial sedition law. And they're using that because the, the national security law they passed has the provisions in it that says it cannot be applied retroactively to things that took place before its date of promulgation, which was June 30th, 2020. So how do they go after their, their enemies from the past? Well, they have two routes. One is they use that sedition law and the other is, and I think this is what we're seeing with the Humanitarian Relief Fund, uh, is they take your continued behavior, that is your continued existence. So that fund existed beyond June 30th, 2020, and therefore anything and everything it does can be branded as a kind of national security threat, as some form of collusion or subversion and so on. So they found ways to go beyond this retroactive limitation by, by either using evidence from uh, before to punish what comes after, and then also saying, well, if you continue to exist, then you're still guilty of everything you ever did. Uh, and so now we know that all the prominent opposition organizations, we're talking about labor unions, we're not talking about you know, uh, you know, rebels in armed conflict, we're talking about just civic groups that are honest and critical of what the government does if it violates human rights. All of those groups have been forced to disband. We know Jimmy Lai's newspaper, which was a so-called opposition newspaper, is forced to disband. And, and I, it's been reported that up to 50 organizations have disbanded. So all of this community groups that could resist are shut down. So this is, is a lot bigger story than just uh, you know, a few people being arrested because it emanates out. The rest is at the heart of it, but there's so much else being done to civic organizations, to schools. All schools are required to teach national security. If teachers, there's even a hotline to report your teachers. If you, a teacher says anything that that somebody in the pro Beijing camp doesn't like, so it 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 really has a, a chilling effect across the society. And that's a tactic being used. And I think in some ways, when, when we in the world say, you know, hear about a Beijing model against the liberal democratic model, you know, these two models being in competition, I think in some ways, Hong Kong is like the, the stereo, you know, the, the, the foundation sort of uh, example uh, that Beijing envisions as its model, that it's not like the old Soviet Union that would convert countries to communism but rather that it would uh, hollow out liberal institutions in these sort of quasi-democratic or soft authoritarian societies. And in some sense, Hong Kong then is an example of how that works. Yeah, well, how, where does it take us? I mean, it sounds like a, a kind of social lobotomy um, where if you remove all these institutions and all this, you know, creative thinking and, and um you know, social connection in a given society, um, where does that society go? It sounds like it's a lobotomy. It sounds like it's, it can never return or not easily. And it sounds like it's going to be a very different place from the place you knew when you lived there. Yes. I mean, in some ways, Hong Kong was the most vibrant society in many ways in Asia through the many years that, that I've spent in Hong Kong. 
uh, because it had a, a, a free press. It still had problems with the press. You know, Beijing would isolate the media, not, not use advertising funds or blacklist press, some press if they were too critical of the regime, certainly the Apple Daily newspaper that Jimmy Lai ran, which has now been uh, wound up, uh, would, was not getting uh, advertising from mainland companies and probably local companies as well that wanted to please Beijing. So there were ways of, of intimidation. But at the same time, the society was so vibrant. That's why 2 million people would show up on the street. And so it, it, it did not suffer fools well. And so if you were too complicit in Beijing's designs, then people would not respect you. And we saw that in the late 20. 20, uh, I think it was late 2020, yeah. I remember when the district council elections were, uh, when the people voted overwhelmingly for the opposition camp as a kind of verdict on what they thought of the demonstrations that were occurring over, over 2019. So, right. so this is, I think, it, what, what you see, and, and now this has been taken off, and Asia has lost uh, dearly for, for this. And when you, when you take the um, obvious experience that Hong Kong has had and you look at it uh, in comparison or in, in, in parallel with uh, Xinjiang and, and the Uyghurs, you say, well, they're really setting up um, a statement that if you want to protest or do anything outside of our uh, instructions, you're in deep trouble. And, and one of the things that comes out you know, to me about the, the Jimmy Lai and the Apple News um, connection is that they're not only saying that you have to close down your operation, you have to disband your organization, whatever we decide is inappropriate, but you're also going to get prosecuted. And the right. message there is that closing it down is not enough. We never want to see it come up again. And if Jimmy Lai can go down the block and form another Apple, ah, we're going to stop him. And we're going to show the world that we're going to stop him by arresting him. And, and it's not just arresting, because arresting under some laws may mean a few months in jail. But under this national security law, just today, they, the uh, uh, magistrate's court authorized the moving of Jimmy Lai's case to the court of first instance, what, what is traditionally called the high court in Hong Kong. And in that court, the charges against him can result in a sentence of life in prison. Oh, God. So it's it, by moving it, if they didn't move it, then they would face limits on how many years they could sentence him to. So removing it to a place where he could be sentenced to life in prison is what, what just took place this very day. That's awful. <clears throat> so, I mean, they're, they're good at it. You know, you have to give them credit. They're good at it. They're yeah. better than uh, Vladimir Putin is, certainly. Um, they, and they don't use violence. They use this prosecution uh, under color of law approach. Yeah. And although, as you mentioned, there are people who continue to protest, um, uh, both in, uh, in Russia and, and in uh, China, in Hong Kong, um, it, it seems to me they're in, in Hong Kong, they're good enough to really stop this. And yeah, it, it really has no chance of coming back. Right. There's, a, there's really no protest now. I think the other day, a couple people were walking down the street, uh, three of them trying to protest. <laughs> There's just virtually not. Uh, it takes a lot of courage to even express an opposing view. So the result is people in the media, for example, find it hard. To, it used to be uh, because in Asian society, professors are highly respected and they're often consulted by the media to, uh, to provide analysis of events and developments that are going on. Uh, but now reporters that contact me over here in New York uh, from are, are doing so because they can't find anybody locally willing to speak up on these issues, uh, it's very risky for them to do so. So uh, this is, is, is a problem. It not just deprive the people of hard news, but also of analysis. Yeah, well, it, sound, it sounds like state TV in, in Russia, doesn't it? It's the same kind of news control thing. And that's got to be part of the program. If you want to do an autocratic takeover, uh, you control all the information. But let's talk about information. Um, here we are, you and me, on, on a formidable news organization, Think Tech Hawaii, uh, <laughs> and we're discussing this freely. 
We're yeah. discussing it within the First Amendment of, of the United States, such mm -hmm. as still exists. Um, and we are discussing it for the world to hear because think tech streams everywhere. Um, at the same time, in order for you to get this information, uh, it had to leave China. Somebody had to, you know, keep you current so you could keep us current. And you're not keeping us current only on think tech. Uh, you're keeping us current in all your writings, your university appearances, uh, your, your panel programs and webinars. You get out there and speaking in various forums. Was that for I? Uh, and and uh, therefore, <laughs> um, you know, the information that you are getting from China is being uh, propagated in, in a number of places. So how dangerous is this for, for them, you know, with whom you speak in China, in Hong Kong, and for you, a person who, um, who knows, uh, theoretically, you're in violation of the national security law, aren't you? Don't answer yeah, that. Please. Don't answer that. Well, yeah, theoretically, uh, you as well, uh, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going national... back anytime soon. I'll tell you that. <laughs> yeah, the national security law applies worldwide, uh, and so if you're bringing a hatred or contempt to Hong Kong's government or China's government, then you might be uh, accused of that. Uh, and so, yeah, it, it's a problem. I, I, but a lot of this stuff, you know, be, this this is the sort of beauty and, and tragedy of a, a quasi-open society. Uh, places like North Korea have probably the worst human rights violations in the world, but very little of it is reported because nobody can go there and report on it. But in societies, as I mentioned earlier, these sort of soft authoritarian or quasi-democratic societies with liberal constitutional structures and promises of human rights and free speech, even while they're often violated, uh, I mean, carried out in the breach, they're violated uh, a lot. Uh, a lot of information can get out of those societies, international reporting and so on. Uh, and then, of course, some people leaving and coming abroad and talking about what they experienced uh, and so on. So they, they, they leak, these societies leak a lot of information. And I think that's kind of what almost all of us work with. We can watch it from day to day. I mentioned to you earlier that in the courts, now when they hear these hearings, they forbid the reporters from reporting anything except the outcome. So they're trying, they try to plug the leaks, but it's hard to do so 100% uh, because a lot of what's happening can be combined with, uh, you know, legal training that you and I have to sort of understand what's happening uh, beyond what the reporters are allowed to report. So we can get, get a, a pretty good sense of, of, of what's happening. Now, people like myself and yourself, uh, basically your, your new role, I know you were a long time practicing lawyer, but your new role at ThinkTech is, is the media. And so you, you're basically doing your job. That's what you're doing. You're not trying to do more than that. And I'm the same. I'm an academic and my field is constitutional development and human rights. So that's what I, I talk about. I try to provide analysis. And that's, that's kind of what one honestly has to do. Uh, and if people can't do it on the ground, then probably that's an important service because otherwise it won't be done. You know, we were talking before the show about all these <clears throat> um, elements on the news cycle, all these news streams. Uh, and, you know, it is depressing to, to hear all these, a number of streams, including Hong Kong and Russia and other places, several other places in the world where autocrats have emerged, where constitutional law has become a joke, um, where, um, and, and of course, where you have war crimes, uh, atrocities, um, you have manipulation of information, uh, you have uh, Im imprisonment in violation of any sense of civil liberties. And it just strikes me, and the reason I say it, it bothers me emotionally, is that I, I see it getting worse. I see it in more places. These news streams seem to be telling us that it's, it's happening all over the bloody world. Uh, and so that must affect you too. What, what is your reaction to seeing all these news streams, including especially Hong Kong, but so many other places uh, where we have autocrats who are um, destroying democracy? I think, you know, of course, I teach this uh, human rights, so 
I, I'm constantly called upon to try to train youngsters, young people, to be able to analyze and to cover these issues. But in the human rights work, a lot of young lawyers think it's all about going to court. Uh, when human rights are being violated on this level, it's rarely about going to court. It's about publicity. It's about putting it out there and constantly, the old jargon was naming and shaming, but putting it out there. And, and these regimes kind of help you because they're sometimes so outlandish, uh, you know, like uh, Putin when people would discover thousand dead bodies around a city. Well, all oh, well, that's all staged. You know, that's his claim. So, so it's so transparently false or that the government there's Nazis. Uh, no one really believes that. Probably even his supporters don't believe that. They probably think it's clever uh, argument. But that's about it. So I think that's kind of the way this works. Uh, so when a regime goes too far and, and extreme measures, uh, and what we're seeing in Hong Kong, I think, is that the nub of it is they're saying, well, Hong Kong is still the same, that free freedoms are protected. Uh, you, as Carrie Lam, the, the current chief executive, said, you just need to know where the red line is at. That's a famous line. <laughs> and she, and well, of course, double entendre, maybe a triple entendre. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So I think that, that the transparency sometimes is of, of, of you know, what they're saying is, is clear. And so the, the trick is to get it out there and get people to understand it. And then you, you hope, and sometimes it's a futile hope, but you hope that eventually, uh, you know, the right truth that someone would say will prevail and uh, better decisions will be made. But, but it's, not, it's not very optimistic at the moment. Yeah. Well, you know, a lot of this has got to do with technology, information technology, all this social media. Is a great weapon uh, for these autocrats to use, for yeah. uh, Beijing to use on Hong Kong. I'm sure that happens. Um, but you know, social media works in two two ways on the street, and um, you can you can have the um, the protesters speak through social media, communicate, you know, create a mesh of protest uh, electronically. Yeah. And I think that might be happening to some limited degree in all these places. I mean, for example, yesterday there was a TV program in in Moscow. Uh, was being broadcast to the country, and yeah. some retired Russian general um, made a speech in the middle of the TV program, saying that the war in uh, uh, Ukraine was wrong, and uh, and there were war crimes happening, and, and made these statements against Putin. I, I, I'm not sure where he is now. He could be in Lubyanka prison right now, but he, <laughs> it's like that woman who ran behind the newscaster with a sign said "Stop the war." But you have these little Spurts of protest, and and they seem most effective when they are on the media, uh, most effective when they are in social media or electronically disseminated. My question to you is: uh, You think that'll increase? You think it's effective? You think it can turn this around? Well, this is the, is the hope, and I, that's why I'm saying, if you're outside of there and this story is told, and you're dedicated to telling the story and getting the truth out then you make it at least a little bit more viable for someone inside to push back, uh, that there's some uh, you know, support for, for what the story that they know is happening, and they can find alternative sources of information, uh, usually using VPNs to get around uh, the state media. Uh, but, it, but it is so important that the story be told, just as you're doing right now. Uh, it, it may seem like you're far away and will have little impact, but it matters. Uh, it matters what we say in the classroom. It matters uh, what's reported and so on, and the analysis that's provided. Well, I want to I want to add a point to that, or at least um, ask you about a point that seems to complement that. Uh, and that is that we are speaking right now to a, a public lot of viewers. Um, and, you know, it, it takes a while for streaming information to actually stream and reach its, reach its highest destination in the world. Um, but we are speaking, if you, if you look at our uh, stats, we're speaking to, to some extent, Hawaii, to some extent, the mainland U.S. Yeah. Uh, in smaller fractions, we're speaking to Europe and Asia. Um, and it'll, it'll keep going. Uh, it'll be out there for a while. And somebody may not know about it or see it or feel that it's worth viral you know, reproduction for, for months. 
So my, my feeling is, my question is, um, if everyone is streaming like this, does it have an effect beyond the immediate market? Um, is, a, is a show like this or your teaching uh, in uh, the university in India uh, or your, your writings and teachings in the U.S., um, is, is that likely to get beyond the immediate market? I think it does. I think it shapes the, the general political culture. Uh, but the problem we face is that the other side is, is speaking too. And they're pushing back and they, they find an audience. Just today I was reading how Orban in Hungary, that he's widely admired by a lot of people uh, in certain political sectors in America. So they, he's, a, he's sort of against liberal constitutionalism, liberal democracy. He wants illiberal democracy. And so the, that's the challenge today. And that a lot of people who won't hear you because their information is in a bubble that only says things that they want to hear. Uh, how do you reach them? And I think this is the biggest challenge that we're facing with free speech today is, is this problem of disinformation within these information bubbles and how can we respond to it and still be committed to free speech? Uh, it's, it's a kind of a, a contradiction there. Uh, so drawing those lines of, of where we will control that kind of thing uh, is, has been proven very difficult. We have to be Akamai about it, though. I was telling you before the show that uh, Think Tech has had a remarkable increase because of the COVID and Zoom model we've created during COVID. Right. Uh, a remarkable increase in the, in the places in the world where our guests and hosts uh, originate. We have shows that originate in Africa and Latin America and in Europe. We have lots of guests in very disparate places all over the, all over the world. We have really thousands of people who appear uh, remotely. And so maybe I'm taking this too far, but uh, it seems to me that in the world of Zoom, the post-COVID, well, not really in post-COVID, in the COVID Zoom world we live in, um, you know, this process that you're talking about, this process of proliferating social media and other, I don't want to say underground, but other, other electronic protests is probably in dynamic. It's probably growing. And if you look again in a year or two or three, you find more of this, of the globalism okay, of electronic protest. What do you think? Of course. And even as a professor, when I used to go to a campus and give a lecture, I could have 20 uh, people in the audience or 30, whatever, depends on, you know, the this, this situation, what I'm talking about. But now a couple hundred is, is not unusual because I, I do it online and I have to, don't have to go anywhere. Uh, so I think th that's very evident. It's, the problem, of course, is, is like I said, it's people on both sides of all of these things. And Putin is, is controlling a lot of information to millions of people. Uh, so this is the, the, the challenge, is how do you get, uh, a, you know, reasonable analysis past all the obstacles and, uh, and have a chance to respond to and discredit disinformation that's being passed. It affects the election in America. It affects everybody everywhere. So the Hong Kong story is, in a way, a kind of classic repression where you just intimidate everybody into silence. Uh, but the rest of us also face many challenges in this regard and, and on the use of this media you're talking about. Hmm. Well, clearly, Michael, you've got to keep on doing it. And we have to keep on talking to you. <laughs> I, I appreciate that. I want to get back to Hawaii, but it's something that I'm trying to work in. <laughs> We're looking forward to that, Michael. Michael, Michael C. Davis uh, here on Think Tech on Global Connections, uh, talking about Hong Kong, Hong Kong and um, the things going on there, which will undoubtedly continue. And we'll continue in our discussion with him. Thank you, Michael. Thank you.
Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.